mic good? Okay. So I'm going to talk about how poems can begin. Um, and at certain points during my talk, I'm going to invite you to jot down some notes. So it would be helpful if you have an interest in writing poems this summer. I hope at least the poets and what we do. Um, it would be helpful to have a pen and a scrap of paper. Nothing to do with you. Um, so I don't have too many unshakable beliefs about poetry, but one of them is this. We have no idea what will get us to our best work. My favorite illustration of this concept comes not from poetry, poetry but from visual art. Um, Eva Hesse, the German-born American visual artist, who you may, the name may ring a bell because there's a new documentary out about her um, that makes the case for her as one of the greatest artists of the late 20th century. She began as a painter heavily influenced by abstract express, expressionism. And she, may, she might have stayed as a painter heavily influenced by abstract expressionism if she hadn't married the sculptor Tom Doyle. And Tom Doyle in 1965 received an artist residency in Germany. So together they lived there and worked in an abandoned textile factory in um, near Essen. And the buildings still contain machine parts and materials and um, tools that uh, from its previous life as a textile factory. And Hesse began to work on drawings and paintings inspired by the angular forms that she saw all around her in this disused factory. But one night she was in her husband's studio and, alone and she started just messing around with a coil of rope that was there. And um, probably in the way that we all do when we really don't want to be doing what we're meant to be doing, um, any distraction will do. So she started messing around with this rope. And um, maybe she was idly coiling in it and uh, thinking about her next painting. Um, in the way that a writer might doodle in the margins of when they're waiting for the next line or sentence. And so then she became completely engaged in coiling this rope and playing around with this rope um, without the pressure of producing anything. And so ultimately, as some of you may know, she left painting behind to produce the pieces for which she became famous. And I'll show you one of result of her playing, you know, completely unplanned, playing around with rope one night in not even her own studio. Um, and the point being that, and these are the pieces that, you know, for which she became famous. Um, the point being that if she had continued heading straight for the paintings that she'd been trained to do and that her teachers expected her to do and that she expected herself to do, um, she would never have gotten to the work that is regarded as her breakthrough and the work that has spoken to her viewers most deeply. So I, w I wonder all the time how we can translate that experience into poetry. 
Um, and there's only one answer I've been able to come up with, which is try everything. <laughs> because of the traditional pre-modernist conception of the poem as a text that crystallizes this you know, profound wisdom or an urgent, authentic emotion, many poets begin by believing that their surest bet is on a more or less direct transcription of their thoughts or feelings or experiences into language. Targeting tried and true fundamentals of poetic tricks of the trade like image or metaphor or description or narration, the more precisely aimed, the better. The idea being to come up with more or less, some more or less pleasing expression of what the poet already knows. It'd be nice to be able to say something definitive like, that traditional method doesn't work, it's outdated, here's something better. But I can't. But my point isn't that what we've already tried doesn't work, it's that we need to try something new. Um, but it's not that we need to try something new necessarily, it's that we need to try everything. And I'll repeat one more time, you have no idea what's going to bring you to your best work, or even to your next poem. And I'm going to give you an example from my own experience, and then go on to explore a few other approaches that can make poems happen. Uh, but here's in my book, The Cold War, which is a meditation on the anxieties of that period of history, continuing right up to the anxieties of the present. It began with a spam email that circulated in the aftermath of 9-11, which purported to be written by an ex-military commander, and it was supposed to be a series of instructions for surviving a nuclear or bioweapon attack. Something about the matter-of-fact tone of this email made me anxious, and intuitively I thought to pair it with an old journal that I had written during a difficult, high anxiety period of my life, but years earlier. I made a two column chart on my computer and began pasting bits of language from my, from my journal into column A and then from the email into column B, just shreds or fragments. And then I made sentences by reading across the columns. The poem with very little editing is the result of this mashup. I'll show you I'll show you the poem, but I won't read all of it because it's long, but I'll just read a little bit from the beginning. Okay, so document. Woke with a start at three o'clock and decided to write a paper and felt like I was dying and kept things in their proper perspective. Since the media has been the most horrifying experience of my life. For with predictions of the past two nights, I chemical, nuclear, biologically warfared on our turf. Very, very sick. I am a retired asshole, a military weapons expert. Physically or mentally, I want to kill my... Lesson number one. In a good person, there was a series of nerve gas attacks. How worthy but it's all less than 10% of an overpowering desire to be one with someone. The injured were better in the sick shame of it in a few hours. The masochism of the injured died. Children playing grown up on 60 minutes. Well, to be quite frank, one drop of nerve gas could kill a thousand people. Um, yucks of laughter period cramps snaking around my gut. Forget everything that disturbs you. Most humans have seen on TV, in the movies, or read in a novel about this stuff. A wave of intense, well, read that sentence again, out loud. Creepy JB, a friend, this morning. If you remain calm, you will probably remember more. But why not die? It was only my revulsion I could count on to make it sound. What worse is categorized as chemical weapons? There to remember incapacitating agents, lunacy. I need not fear the hype of reporters and politicians, beatings, rape, and death. So, that's just the beginning. <laughs> um, and it's Sorry, it's a kind of grim way to wake up this morning. Um, 
But so although the poem began being about nothing but the side-by-sideness of these two groups of locutions, <coughs> it ended up making, I hope, what James McManus called in his wonderful poetic manifesto slash art, a new kind of sense, which I figure is exactly the job of a poem. I believe in the effect, well, it's hard to talk about poetry without using air quotes, so I believe in the effect of my finished poem. I believe in the effect of my finished poem, its fraught tone, what it communicates about the omnipresence of violence and terror, but it's not something I could have made happen if I approached it directly by having something that I wanted to say about the omnipresence of um, violence and terror. I never would have come to it. Um, it says something I consider important, but it says it slantwise, and it emerged slantwise. So the, now for takeaway number one. I want you to take a minute and jot down the titles or the names of two texts, maybe one personal and one more public, that you would like to try mashing up and see what results. In the same way I mean. don't let sound take over. They, we don't let sound drive the poem. So instead, most, for most of us, most of the time, sound is along for the ride. But what would happen if we let it occupy the driver's seat? Would it take over and crash into a wall of confusion or nonsense? Here's a poem by Harriet Mullen, which is one answer. called Music for Homemade Instruments, improvising with Douglas Hewitt. I dug you artless, I dug you out. Did you redo? You dug me less art. You dug, let's do art. <clears throat> you dug me less art, did you redo? If I left art out, you dug. My artless dug out, you dug, let art out. Did you redo? dugout canoe, easy as a pork pie piper led cinch, easy as a baby bounce, hop on pot, tin pan man, original abstract, did you redo it? Betting on shy cargo, strutting dimple, locales, trumpets, employ a hipster to blow up the native formica, then divide efficiency on hairnets, flukes, faux saxons, you dug me out, didn't you? Did you redo? Ever curtain to experiment with strumpet strutting. Now curtains to milk laboratory. Desecrated flukes and panics displayed by mute politicians all over this whirly gig. Hey, you duck. Art lasts. Did you redo? Well-known mocker of lurching unused brains, tribal and lustrous diddly squats, Latin dimension crepe paper and muscular stacks. Curtains for perky strumpets strutting with mites in the twilight of their origami funkier purses. Artless, you duck. Did you redo? For padding wood at Flatland, thanks. For bamboozle flukes at BAM on my seedy medication. Thanks for my name in the Yuhu. Continental camp out percolating throughout the whirly gig on faux Saxon flukes. You dug art, didn't you? Did you redo? This is one of my very favorite poems to read aloud. The sounds are glorious. It's a poem that doesn't make the old kind of sense in the old kind of way, which might lead some to accuse it of being inaccessible. But actually, I always think it's a poem that anyone can enjoy. A three-year-old or someone who doesn't know English can enjoy it. 
And as Gertrude Stein says, if you enjoy it, you understand it. In fact, when my daughter was in the first grade, her school did a National Poetry Month thing where every day a parent would come in and read a poem over the loudspeaker with their kid after the morning announcements. And so one day my daughter and I read this poem and then I walked her to her classroom. The minute we walked in the door, the whole class of six-year-olds shouted out, did you redo? <laughs> <laughs> so how's that for accessibility and advocacy? Unfortunately, we don't have Harriet Mullen here to ask how this poem began, but obviously sound took over and landed in the driver's seat. I imagine that she may have begun by jazzing around with a number of variations on the first two sentences. I dug you artless, I dug you out, did you redo? The poem's improvisational strategies and syncopated rhythms are called out in the title, Music for Homemade Instruments, and the dedication, Douglas Hewart is a musician and an instrument builder. It took me many readings of this poem before I noticed the central pun, which some of you may have noticed right away because you're smarter than I am. But, um, so, did you redo is didgeridoo, which is an Australian wind instrument. Um, but the approach here is a jazz approach. There, there's a theme and variations, and then there's invention and improvisation on the theme. But despite its jazzy, jumpy language, it's not nonsense. It's a meditation on art, which is very explicit in the poem, and specifically a meditation on the joys of improvisation and painstaking craft, or redoing. That, and, and how, they're, how they, um, they're not opposites, improvisation and craft. They're not opposites, they're not enemies, but they're necessary pals. So for takeaway number two, I want you to think about or let come into your mind a sentence or a phrase that you would like to jazz around with a la Harriet Long. Another way to begin a poem. Sometimes poems begin out of a desire to be in conversation with another poem or poet, or with poetic tradition, and which I, I believe in some sense all contemporary poems could be said to be in conversation with precursor poems or poets or just poetic tradition as a whole. There is no way that we can be in ignorant bliss about what's come before us. Um, and no other art form is more self-conscious, I think, about the weight of its tradition. But right now I'm talking about poems where this conversation with the past or with tradition is overtly called attention to. And one of the ways that attention can happen is with form, which is the ultimate version of the weight of poetic tradition. The poet Terence Hayes has invented a form called the golden shovel that does just that. A golden shovel uses a portion, it could be a line or a stanza or a complete poem, of a precursor poem as end words for a new poem. So I'm going to show you the original golden shovel that, Her that uh, Terence Hayes wrote with its famous precursor. And then I'll tell you the rules for the golden shovel. I'm sure this poem is familiar to many. Um, we Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. And the little epigraph is the pool players, seven at the golden shovel, which is from which Terence Hayes took the name of his inventive form. <clears throat> we real cool, we left school, we lurked late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. And now here's Terence Hayes' Golden Shovel after Gwendolyn Brooks. 
We swing from June to June. We sweat to keep from weeping. 